the Nephilim, many of us are already familiar with the accounts of the giants who rose in the days of Noah, who overran the world with violence, corrupted human genetics, and threatened the very existence of humanity and our salvation, potentially, back in the days of Noah. But they were judged by the flood. But the question remains, how did they return? How did they come back after the flood? This is one of the big questions of Genesis 6, and we're going to jump into that tonight on Thursday Night Theology, which starts right now. Greetings and welcome to Thursday Night Theology, a special broadcast tonight. We are a, a rebroadcast, of a pre-recorded broadcast, rather, um, as I'm away out of town, but I wanted to make sure we had an episode for you tonight. And of course, I am your host, Ryan Peterson, author of Judgment of the Nephilim, the comprehensive biblical study of Genesis 6 and the final Nephilim. But you'll learn more about that later. Right now, we're going to focus on you, which is what Thursday Night Theology is about, where I take three questions uh, tonight, even more than three. It's a special night apply my research to answer it to the best of my ability. And so we're going to hit the big question on Genesis 6. I've been getting this question so much in the past month. Um, it was really important for me to, to revisit it and explain it for all those who are watching my season two watches who are new to my content. I want to explain this question of how did the Nephilim giants return after the flood? Because it, it is an important question, right? We see Clearly, in the story of David and Goliath, the giants have returned. We see the same thing in Numbers 13, but where did they come from? Was there a second incursion? How can we explain it? And why? Why would God allow that? So we're going to explore that. And then we're going to look also at a question about the tree of life. What was it? Was it an actual tree? Did it have supernatural powers? What's the significance of it? We're going to get into that. And I'm going to do some rapid fire questions as well. So we're going to do more than three questions tonight on our episode. So thanks for joining me. So without further ado, you know, we're going to jump right into question one. And of course, as always, you know, put questions in the comments. I do get all my questions in terms of how I get the content for this show. They come from you from the comments, whether it's on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Rumble. Uh, thank you for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. And again, if you have questions you want answered, I will try my best, God willing, to apply my research and answer them for you. So without further ado, we're going to jump right into question one. How did the Nephilim return after the flood? And again, I put no name with this question because so many people, I've probably gotten this question a couple of dozen times in the past month. And... You know, we're going to approach this from a different standpoint. So I'm going to start off, you know, and address the big question, right? How did we get here? How did the Nephilim, how were they born? How did they arrive? So we're going to take a quick overview, of course, of Genesis 6 and go right to see what scripture says here. And of course, we read in Genesis 6, verse 1, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And of course, these sons of God, but not ha Elohim here, these are fallen angels. These are angelic beings. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants, Nephilim, ha Nephilim, the Nephilim, the giants in Hebrew, in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bear children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And again, that's Genesis 6, verses 1 to 4. Now, a couple of interesting things to know. Of course, this is the first passage that contains the Hebrew term Nephilim, which means giant, right? It's a term borrowed from the Aramaic. It is, uh, it, it, it just refers to and means a giant, a supernaturally large being, right? And these were the hybrids. And how did it happen? It came from this, this illicit union of fallen angels, those sons of God and the daughters of men, human women. And one other thing I want to point out from the passage is that it says there were giants in those days and also after that. And many authors and writers and speakers theologians will say, oh, that passage, that part of the verse is detailing that the giants were here before the flood 
and after the flood. However, I really disagree with that. And I break this down in Judgment of the Nephilim to say that I don't think it's talking about that at all. I think it's saying that it started when the human population was spreading. We, this is when the angels who launched this invasion into the human realm to take human women as wives, it started and continued uh, throughout the days of Noah after that. Because if you think about it grammatically, the flood has not even been mentioned yet. Just to say also after that, the that, there's no referent to the flood. It couldn't be because the flood is, is not even mentioned for another basically 12 verses um, into Genesis 6. And so I think it's actually just referring to two epochs that take place in the that lead up to the days of Noah that lead up to the flood. However, we still again see Nephilim giants after the flood. And how did it happen? Did these angels commit this sin again? My answer to that is emphatically no. It's what's called the second incursion. Did they come back, another group of fallen angels, and do this, this uh, fornication with human women again? And I don't believe that's the case. And I want to take you on a journey in a passage that we don't often discuss. It's, not, it's really rarely discussed, but I think drives home the fact of why and I think the Bible is the only book that really highlights the fact of why these angels would never, or any angels would ever try this again, right? And so obviously the flood judgment judged the Nephilim giants. It destroyed them. It killed them. And the fallen angels, of course, were dragged down to the abyss, to the bottomless pit. And how do we know this? We're told this in the book of Jude, verses 6 and 7, and in Second Peter chapter 2, unequivocally, it says that the angels... Uh, were that were, were have been cast down under chains of darkness until the judgment of the great day, until the great tribulation. And it says, what did in Jude? It says that what what did these angels do to receive this very unique punishment? It said, going after strange flesh for fornication, like Sodom and Gomorrah. So it's making it very clear that this is illicit sexual sin that took place, and these angels were brought down to the abyss where they remain in chains. They were imprisoned. Just this faction of the fallen angels for millennia, right? They're still there till now. Jesus, we read again that he visited these angels, at, you know, during uh, after the crucifixion to proclaim his victory on the cross. So they remain there today. So we're gonna. Put, I want to show you because I think the Bible explains in Ezekiel chapter thirty-one. This is a passage I really dissect. I think it's one of the most important chapters. Uh, and probably the most important chapter in the Bible that's the least discussed. You know, it, no, there are very few commentaries, sermons, teachings on it. However, it is extremely important to understand this chapter to really get the full story of what happened in the days of Noah. And I think it, this passage uniquely gives the account of the angel who led this rebellion, this specific rebellion to take human women and father the Nephilim and describes why a second incursion didn't take place. So we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 31. And just to give the setting, this is what I call an esoteric passage. It's one of these chapters, like in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, where God is addressing a human king, a human ruler. Uh, however, on paper, initially, right, the chapter is addressed to a human ruler, but he's really speaking past that person, past that leader, to an angel, to a fallen angel. We see this in Isaiah 14 with the king of Babylon, where it's it's clearly addressing the devil or even addressing the Antichrist, I think actually addressing both. And then we see a similar thing in Ezekiel chapter 28, where it talks about the prince of Tyre, that he sealed up the sum, that he's perfect in beauty, that he had no sin in him. He was in the garden of Eden, Eden, the garden of God. He wore the precious jewels, the precious stones, of the high priest on his chest. And it gives, you know, the nine stones that Aaron wore as the high priest of Israel. And the Septuagint has the exact same 12 because Aaron wore 12 stones. The Masoretic text has nine of those stones on Lucifer, I believe, in Ezekiel 28. And the Septuagint version actually has all 12 stones. So what is it saying? It's talking about the devil before his fall in his righteous, his, his, uh, his righteous service to God in the Garden of Eden. So this could not be the Prince of Tyre who's in view in this passage. And we see a similar thing just three chapters later in the book of Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 31. However, 
This Pharaoh of Egypt that's being addressed, it, the, the being that God is truly speaking to is not Satan. And this is so important to understand that there's another angel, another fallen angel, a second one that is given a lot of attention in scripture. It is the, this, this being called the Assyrian. And so we're going to unpack this passage. And I think he actually also appears in the, in the New Testament as well as Apollyon or Abaddon, the angel of the bottomless pit. But we're going to unpack all this and show how this helps confirm the fact that there was no second incursion. So let's jump right into it. So here we are in Ezekiel chapter 31, and I'm just starting right from verse 1. And it says, the word of the Lord came unto me, meaning the prophet Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude. Whom art thou like in thy greatness? Behold, the Assyrian, and this is the being in question, this is the fallen angel, was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of a high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. And again, that's Ezekiel 31 verses 1 to 3. And so right away, we're starting to see the language, the illustrative language that God is using to refer to this being. He compares him to a cedar in Lebanon. And this is language that is used to refer to fallen angelic beings throughout the Old Testament. In fact, it's also used to refer to the Nephilim. Here's Amos chapter 2, the second passage here, verses 9 to 10, where God, speaking of King Og and King Sihon, the Amorite kings, you know, it talks about King Og's bed is described as being 13 feet long. So these were the giant, these were the, the gatekeepers of the promised land because their kingdom was due east. And I'm going to go back to the passage, but their kingdom was due east of the promised land. So Joshua, when he was leading the Israelites uh, across the Jordan River, he had, which was God's designated place, the house of the passing. It's called Bethabara in the New Testament. So this is where God designated the, play, the location for the Israelites to cross into the promised land, who stood in their way? The Amorite kings, Og and Sihon, these Nephilim giant kings. And look how God describes them. Of course, God gave the Israelites the victory. God went before them and fought both of these kingdoms. And it's amazing how you see with King Og even says that he had 60 cities, right? With stone walls up to the, up to the heavens, right? So they have, we see the supernatural uh, fallen angelic technology, right? The, the Nephilim had, had advanced geometry and science and construction. Look how God describes the victory over them. Here, we, going back now to Amos 2, God says, Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. Also, I brought you from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. So several important things to glean here. One, God, again, and we see this idea of the Lebanese cedar, which could grow up to 100 to 150 feet. God compares the Og and Sihon to a Lebanese cedar, just like the Assyrian is called a cedar in Lebanon. Additionally, notice how God is, he is putting the victory over these two Nephilim kings right up there with the exodus, with the delivery of, of Israel from the Egyptian armies in the Exodus and from Pharaoh. One of the greatest acts of God's deliverance and supernatural miracles in the Bible. God's saying, yeah, just like I brought you out of Egypt, this was another great victory of mine. So this is to show you how imposing the Nephilim were. And look what God says. He said they're like cedars in Lebanon. And notice the illustrative language that the tree becomes a metaphor for these kings. So we're going to see that as we continue in Ezekiel 31. So look what it says here. Um, actually, let me just, let me, yeah, let's continue. Uh, look at this description here, the descriptive language. It says that the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs. The chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. So this, again, is where we're seeing a transition to the supernatural. Right before this passage, it says of the Assyrian, that he had he had branches, the rivers made him powerful. Remember, the Garden of Eden had many rivers. Four rivers came out of the, out of the Garden of Eden. The waters made him powerful. It says, it says that his his boughs, his branches were multiplied. His fruit. And it says under his shadow, 
dwelt all the great nations, right? And again, this is just going straight verse by verse in Ezekiel 31. And what is it telling us? That he was the global preeminent ruler of the world, right? And in Judgment of the Nephilim, I break this down and compare it to Daniel chapter 4, where you have King Nebuchadnezzar who has this dream of this mighty tree that, again, has a very similar metaphoric language. It has these trees. It has, uh, oh, I mean, sorry, large branches. It has uh, tons of beautiful fruit and abundance, and all the beasts of the field were under it. And Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar, the tree in your dream was you. It symbolizes you and your kingdom and your might. Well, we're seeing the exact same metaphorical language used to describe the Assyrian. And like I showed before, is that he won one, he was powerful. Two, all the nations dwelt under him. So he was a global ruler, an emperor of the world, right? In in the pre-flood, in the antediluvian era. And additionally, it says that we start seeing this transition to Eden, to the Garden of God. Look what it says about the other cedars, the other angels, right? We see this in this passage here. It says that the cedars in the garden of God could not hide them. Right now, we're just like Ezekiel 28. We're transitioning to the garden of Eden. We're transitioning to the supernatural realm. So clearly, this could not be talking about an Assyrian king, whether it's Sennacherib or a Pharaoh. And it says that there was no, no other angel was like him, right? They envied him. They wanted his power. He ruled over all of them, right? In the book of Enoch, you know, you, they talk about Semyaza being the leader of the, the watcher angels who led the rebellion. This, this being the Assyrian, Apollyon, Abaddon, he is that lead angel. The Bible's identifying him, right? Clearly here that he was the leader of this rebellion. And, and what can we see? How, what, what happens is that just like we see with the devil, he becomes exalted by pride, exalted by his power, by his might, and God judges him. How? By sending him to the abyss, by dragging him down in the floodwaters, right? And the amazing thing is not only does Ezekiel chapter 31 reference the flood in the days of Noah, it actually references the Garden of Eden more than any other chapter in the Bible. So this is a chapter that you should really be studying to understand the ancient world and the angelic conflict that has been raging for millennia in scripture, right? And <clears throat> we see that the judgment of the Assyrian and the fallen angels is, is being dragged down to what Ezekiel calls the nether parts of the earth, the tehom in the Old Testament in Hebrew, the abyss, the prison for these spirits. And look what it says here. In, 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 in verse 14, it gives the reason for why God did this. It says, to the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their trees stand up in their height, all that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death to the nether parts of the earth in the midst of the children of men with them that go down to the pit. So God is being very clear that I'm making, I'm, I'm issuing this cataclysmic judgment on these fallen angels. Because remember, the devil wasn't a part of this. The devil is still going to and fro on the earth. We see him in the book of Job in heaven in Job chapters one and two. The chapter 12 in Revelation says that he, he accuses the brethren in heaven day and night. So this was a subset, a faction of the fallen angels. And God says, I'm taking them down to death, to hell, right? Uh, and with this judgment so that no one tries this again, that no, none of these trees, none of the angels would ever try to exalt themselves again. This is the last time they're going to do it. And if you think about it, the fact that they were punished immediately, right? The devil's punishment is still forthcoming, right? It's been for thousands of years of human history and he still hasn't received his ultimate punishment. These angels were taken off the board immediately the flood took them away they've been locked away for millennia in hell and those is god's sending them down to death to the pit so that none would do this again and so powerful powerful stuff but let's look at another passage here okay so we, I, I won't get to that just yet but let me just let me just highlight ezekiel 31 and, and i go into much more detail of this in judgment and i show the exact tie because it also tells us the timing right God even says, in the day that I judged you, in the day I brought you to the nether parts of the earth. 
uh, the flood waters were restrained. They abated. And I connect that to Genesis 8 and the timing of Genesis 8, because we're told after 150 days, that's when the flood waters were restrained, when they were abated. That's right in the beginning of, of Genesis 8, in the flood chronology. And why does that matter? Because what we see is that when these beings are ultimately, these sons of God, are released from the abyss, because they're going to be released, right? So Jude says that they're there until the judgment of the great day. They are released at the fifth trumpet of Revelation chapter nine. And when they are released as these locust, grotesque, hybrid beings that have the face of a man, hair of a woman, teeth of lions, they have claws, they have tails, they are degraded hybrid beings. What happens? It says that they now torment those who don't have the seal of God in their foreheads. The unsaved in the great tribulation get tormented by these beings for five months, which on the Hebrew calendar is 150 days, right? So this gives us the connection, right? And who's with them? Apollyon, Abaddon. This is also when the Assyrian is now released. So it all connects with that Abaddon is the Assyrian in the Old Testament. He is the angel of the bottomless pit, and he's been in the bottomless pit since 150 days from the flood. That took place in the days of Noah. Ezekiel 31 ties it right back between, is the, is, it's really the connective tissue between Revelation and Genesis in the days of Noah. And so we see, we can, we can see again that not only is God giving us the timing, he's identifying the leader of this rebellion, and he's telling us that the, the deterrent effect of this was so powerful that no angel would try this again. And so that's reason number one for why there was no second incursion. But let's get to, well, where did, well, if there was no second incursion, where did the giants come from? Well, I'm going to explain that as well. And I believe the DNA came through, the DNA of the Nephilim came through on the ark with Noah and his family, specifically through the wives of Noah's sons. And we see this with the wife of his son, Ham. And how can we know this? So there's a very interesting thing about Noah's uh, genealogy, his lineage, is that when we look at the pre-flood patriarchs and in, in their genealogies, of course, are in the early books of Genesis, Genesis 4, Genesis 5, Genesis 10 and 11. We see that, of course, there were expanded lifespans. Many men lived to be 600 years old, 700, 800. Methuselah lived to be 969 years old, right? All this is pre-flood. And I believe that because of the hyperbaric atmosphere in the pre-flood world, it was a different physical atmosphere and environment. It allowed for longer lifespans, right? These The conditions of the world before the flood, as they were in the Garden of Eden, I believe allowed for these long lifespans. So what did that mean? What's the relevance of that? What you see is most men were having their first sons in the lineages given in scripture between the ages of 50, 60, or 70 years old. And I believe that's because, because of the extended lifespans, people, men actually reached puberty in their 50s and therefore started having childbearing years much later than we normally have now today. And so you see this consistent trend until you get to Noah. When you get to Noah, let's look at when, when Noah has his first child. He has his first child, it says, and Noah, this is Genesis 5, verse thir uh, 32, Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth, his three sons. And um, why does this matter? Well, and we're going to come back to the second passage in a second. Why is this important? Because we know from the biblical chronology that Noah boarded the ark. The ark actually, he went on the ark and the flood started when Noah was 600 years old. And yet and still he didn't have his first child until he was 500. God, so this is after, so Noah didn't have his first son until after God had already announced he was going to flood the world, that all flesh had corrupted itself. And he gave a 120 year probation until this judgment was going to come upon the earth. So think about it. Noah waited 20 years until after God warned him to start having children. What's the testimony in Genesis 6 all the way up to the time that God gives Noah the commission to build the ark and restart the human population? God says three times all flesh had corrupted itself. So this is what was taking place. So the genetics, the, the, the fallen gel and genetics 
in the world had taken over so much of the population that God said three times, all flesh, even the animals had corrupted themselves. And God said he repented and he regretted even making humanity. And so, of course, he chooses Noah. And we're told that Noah, when he's introduced, says Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. He was tamim. He was, in, in the Hebrew, he was without blemish. He was still a pure human being. His lineage, um, his generations or his ancestors were all pure humans. And of course, Noah was also a believer, right? He was just, he was justified. He believed in Messiah. So that's why God chose him to reboot the human race after the flood. So of course, his sons as well, I believe, Shem, Ham, and Japheth were also Tamim without blemish. But however... By waiting so long until the flood judgment was about to start, by waiting till he was 500 years old, and then when his sons were marrying age, at the age they're going to even have a wife and have children, the odds of finding three women who had no trace of Nephilim DNA was pretty much slim to none. And, uh, and then on top of it, you look at Ham, who was a rebel against God, who were a rebel against Noah as well, sins against Noah in this mysterious uh, sin in his tent after the flood. And I believe he wouldn't have been at nearly as concerned about finding a wife who didn't have Nephilim DNA. And I believe it's through his wife and specifically through his son Canaan that we see the Nephilim DNA carry on throughout the, after the flood. And so let's go back to this passage here. And so again, we see, look, look what God says here in Genesis 6, verses 10 to 12, that, you know, Noah begat his sons. And says, again, the earth also was corrupt before God. This is at the time Noah's now fathered his three sons and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So again, it's clear that at the time Noah waited, by the time Noah had his sons, it was you know, probably 99% of the human population had some trace of this Nephilim genetics. They were taking over the world. We're told in the Proclamation books that they were consuming humans and re literally pushing pure humanity, the human race, the race created by God to genetic extinction, right? And this was the devil's plan, of course, to try and thwart the birth of the human Messiah. So, yeah, so we can see that I believe that's so it's through this. And, and then when we look after the flood, we see further evidence of this because we can trace the post diluvian giants, the post diluvian Nephilim can all be traced back to Canaan, the grandson of Noah. They can all be traced back to him. And let's just look at a quick example here. So look at this here. This, this, is, this is the lineage of Canaan, who's, by the way, one of the most mysterious figures in the Bible. You know, he's mentioned over 160 times we see the name of Canaan in the Old Testament. And yet he's never quoted. There's no action of him ever described. There's nothing ever directly said about Canaan, except that he's cursed by Noah. So right there, there's a glaring red flag. I think the Bible is telling us there's something infamous about this figure. But let's look at his descendants here and watch the pattern here. Watch what's going to take place. So again, this is Genesis 10, verses 15 to 20. And we read, and Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, keep that name in mind, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, Archite and the Sinite, and the Avrodite and the Zemorite, and the Hamathite, and afterwards were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. So all of these are called the Canaanites. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboim, even unto Lasha. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in the countries and in their nations. But notice again, a couple of things here, the names of his descendants and that their territory went all the way to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, let's fast forward to when God is now commanding the Israelites to retake the promised land, which, by the way, was called the land of Canaan. Why? Because the devil knew. I believe this is a part of what the cosmic chess match, to quote L.A. Marzulli, where God, after the flood, used the flood to wipe out the Nephilim and the fallen angels and imprison them. And then the strain of the Nephilim DNA makes it through on the ark. And now the post-Diluvian Nephilim 
what happens? Satan says, I'm going to put them right in your promised land. If you want your people to come into this land, they have to go through my giants. I'm going to set up Og and Sihon on the other side of the Jordan River to stop them from even getting to the Jordan. But once you get in, that's where we see all the rest of the post diluvian giants are right in God's promised land, which was named after Canaan in the post-flood world. This is not a coincidence, but let's look at when God commands the Israelites to now take over and go attack and reca recapture the promised land and notice what we see. Now, this is Deuteronomy chapter seven, verses one to three. And it says, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou, and when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. So this is this is the harem, the ban, the extermination of these, these, these nations. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them, neither shalt thou make marriages with them, that thy daughters thou shalt not be given to his son, nor his daughter shall take unto them thy son. So here we see God is ordering the extermination of these people but notice the nations named they're all the same descendants of canaan we saw in the earlier passage of genesis 10 it's the descendants of canaan the wars that are being fought against the nephilim infested nations this is targeted warfare it wasn't god saying just go in and kill everybody god specifically identifies the seven nations and these are the descendants of canaan and again notice it's not even all the descendants of ham Ham had other sons, Cush, Mizraim, which is in Egypt, right? There is no uh, such ban instituted against the Egyptians, right? Even though they were enemies of, of Israel at a time. But remember, Joseph, who fathered two of the tribes of Israel, Manasseh and Ephraim, their mother was a Seneth, an Egyptian princess, or Egyptian royalty, rather. Uh, she was a part of the royal house. But she, so, but it was really Canaan who was the target of this. And so, the, and God is telling them to go in and don't marry them, show them no mercy, take them out. Why? Because this is where the post diluvian DNA of the giants shows up. And so it can all goes back to Canaan. And what I even show in Judgment of the Nephilim is that if you look at, say, even Numbers 13, when the 12 tribes send 12 spies to go scout the promised land, right? The land of Canaan. And they go out and they see the sons of Anak, these three Nephilim. This is in Numbers 13. Ahimon, Seshai, Talmai. Well, they're called the sons of Anak because Anak, who is the forefather of the Anakim, the giants, an another tribe of giants after the flood, is their father, right? Well, we find out in the book of Joshua that the father of Anak, the giant Anak, was Arba. But who is Arba? We go back to Genesis and we've learned that Arba was one of the sons of Heth in the book of Genesis. And who is Heth? Let's just go right back to our passage before. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. Heth was the secondborn son of Canaan, who is the father of Arba, who is the father of Anak, who is the father of the Anakim. And when you look at the descriptions of the giants after the flood, the Anakim are like the gold standard of what giants were after the flood. So, so, you know, God puts this out there and we let scripture interpret scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, they can all be traced back to Canaan. And isn't it interesting that even when you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, where another area that God just went and wiped them out, right? He sent fire and brimstone upon them and wiped them out. What were they trying to do? Now, oftentimes they're linked to homosexuality, but when you think about what they were literally trying to do in Sodom and Gomorrah, they were trying to have relations with angels, with the two angels that came to see Lot and rescue him out of Sodom. They said, "Let we want to know them. We want to have relations with them, fornication. So again, we see this link, this, this link back to the days of Noah and God's judgment. And these, again, were the descendants of Canaan. So this was targeted warfare. But let's continue here. Let's continue and see what else we can find here. So we looked at, okay, here's Deuteronomy. I want to I think I'm going to jump to a passage here. This is, um, let's see what I have here. Okay, I'm going to go here. Let's go here. 
Okay, so this is this is from a great book here. This is from the last vials of Robert Perdon in, in 1866. And look what he says about this. He says, the giants who Satan had raised up by seducing the angels were ignominiously put down. I mean, they were killed in the flood. His gigantic allies retreated to the mountains of Canaan or to the recesses of the north and left him to try a new campaign with allies of the ordinary kind. No angel dared any longer to intermarry with the daughters of men. So again, he's saying very clearly after the flood, there was no second incursion. And Satan, even if he had been so inclined, could have raised up no second gigantic race. Then came the race of the heroes. And the, the, the capitalized were already there. That emphasis was already in the original text, just so you know. The sons of the giants, the descendants of the angels, no doubt, were leaders in every work of rebellion. We find in ancient mythology innumerable persons who belong to the earliest ages of tradition. These persons were heroes, warriors, and princes. Princes. This was the semi-gigantic war, a race of semi-giants, the grandsons of the angels, putting forth their superior strength and genius to subjugate the world. And again, that's the, again, that's the last vials by Robert Perdon in 1866. And he really drives home a number of points here, right? The one he says that the angels never tried this again. And that these giants after the flood were the grandsons. And I believe that, right? Because a lot of times you see descriptions of the post-flood or post-diluvian Nephilim, and they're called, they were born of the giants. They were, uh, they were a son of a giant, born of a giant, not born of an angel, not born of a son of God. So this is the, you know, a, a second generation, a third generation from the, from the fallen angels. And um, I also quote, quote John Fleming and Judgment of Nephilim, who wrote a great book, The Fallen, uh, the fallen, angels, and he fallen angels and Heroes of Mythology, where he emphasizes that the flood put an end to these relations. It was God saying, I'm putting an end to that era of this, this, this marriage this sinful marriage ever happening again. And so I think that's, you know, the old church knew that there was no second incursion, even though there were giants after the flood. And if you think about it with mythology, you have in ancient Greek mythology, you have the gods, you have the demigods who are hybrids, and then you have the heroes who were also supernatural, but they weren't the direct offspring of a god. And so I think even other ancient cultures understood these kind of different levels and degrees of supernatural beings who are walking the earth. Crazy stuff, right? And so that is my answer to that question. I think conclusively we can know from scripture that, again, when we look at all the different groups of Nephilim after the flood, they can be traced back to Canaan. I say there's one exception there with Nimrod. I'm not going to get into that right now. But I think he's a unique case. I think something happened to Nimrod in his life. I don't think he was born uh, as a supernatural hybrid being. But everyone else can be traced right back to Canaan. And I think even the reason for Noah cursing Canaan in Genesis, right? Because remember, it was Ham who sinned against Noah. Not Canaan, but he curses Canaan. I believe because Canaan was already revealing that he had the Nephilim DNA. So that is my answer to question number one. Hope you enjoyed it. And by the way, I hope you're having a great chat. I forgot to mention this is also a great time of fellowship. I hope people are talking, sharing your own theories on this and let people know where you're from, your ideas. This I want. This is still live because it's still premiering live. So I hope the chat's good. And you never know, I might jump in the chat live tonight. So look for me as well. Uh, so, but yeah, that is my answer to question number one. We're going to take a quick break and we come back. We're going to talk about the tree of life. Is it real? Is it a tree? Does it have supernatural powers? And Will we see it again? Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Okay, and so you just saw the uh, trailer for Judgment of the Nephilim, uh, my first book. For the audiobook, these are some of the kind reviews I received. Um, there are lots of reviews for Judgment of the Nephilim on Amazon. It's available on Amazon, available on my website. The links to all my books, my documentary films, my study guides, they are all in the description of this video. Uh, but yeah, but Judgment of the Nephilim is, you know, the comprehensive biblical study of Genesis. We're talking about how did the Nephilim return after the flood? How can a fallen angel even conceive a child of the human woman? Uh, do we have Nephilim in, in the world today? What was the status at the present? All these questions and much, much more. All the big questions uh, are answered in Judgment of the Nephilim which again is my first book, which you can find in the description and links to it's available in audio, in ebook, and of course in paperback and hardcover. You can find the links to that, all those things in the description of this video. And you know, another important thing about why I think Genesis 6 is so important is because it helps our witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, right? When we think about the people who are questioning the Bible, who are questioning the faith of Christianity, and is it real? Is, is this gospel of Jesus Christ true? This is such an important account because I don't think you can explain the flood, why God flooded the world. I don't think you can explain the judgments of Canaan when God, as we just saw, said, go in and exterminate them, all of them, all the people of these, of these areas. And again, it wasn't a wholesale, irrational, just kill everyone. It was a specific group of people who carried a DNA of genetics that were introduced by our enemy, our true enemies, right? Satan and his angels and how they were trying to literally exterminate, not just us, but our chance of redemption, our chance of being saved, our chance of being with God eternally, which is God's plan. If you don't understand the Nephilim, if you don't understand Genesis six and what is actually taking place, I don't think you can adequately defend the faith which the Bible commands us to do, right? To always have a reason for why we can defend and, and, and defend our word. So just another good plug there for studying our scriptures, right? And getting deep like we do on Thursday Night Theology. So let's get to question number two. Um, I think this is an excellent question as well. And we're going to look here at a, at a question about the tree of life. And so this is awesome, right? So this is from Connie in Roswell, Georgia. In Roswell, Area 51. No, not that, not that Roswell, uh, Roswell, Georgia. Uh, and I love this because she said, Ryan, I submitted the following question about a year ago, right before you took a break from the show at the end of season one. I still would love to hear your thoughts. Would love to know your thoughts and understanding about the tree of life. What exactly was it? Was it actually a tree, a magical, mystic object? What happened to it? Is it still in existence today? What would have happened if Adam and Eve had approached it? So awesome question, right? Great, great question. And so my answer is I believe the tree of life is definitely real, that it was a real actual tree. But to your point, was it mystical? Uh, yes. Was it supernatural? Absolutely, right? I believe it was a totally supernatural uh, created and a tree with supernatural properties, right? And so not only do I think it was real, I think that it, one, it still exists. And two, we're going to see it again, in the future. And I think this is all laid out in scripture. So let's just start in Genesis and look at what the Bible says about the tree of life. And this tells us right from the first sentence here of what's taking place. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, referring to Adam. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So we're going to take, I'll go back to that, but we see right here, one, we have to remember that the garden of Eden was supernaturally created, right? It was created by God. And I believe brought down from heaven by God, that God planted this here. So right away, we're entering the supernatural realm. We think about the garden of Eden. And in fact, I call the garden of Eden, in Judgment of the Nephilim, the first temple of God. Because when you think about a temple in the biblical sense, it is where the divine realm and the human realm intersect. It's where God chooses to manifest his presence before humanity on earth, and where he steps into time, steps into the human realm, and manifests himself before humanity. Any place that happens is like a temple. And so I believe the garden was the original temple of God 
on earth. So when we think about the fruits that are being planted and the trees are being planted, it's all literally divine, right? And if you even think about the temple, right? Think about the temple. Where did the specifications, the design, the dimensions, all the decorations of the temple came directly from God? So just like the garden, it was designed by God, just like the tabernacle, right? The early form of the temple. It's designed by God specifically, or the ark for that matter, right? A temple floating in the water, I believe. So if you think about it too, I'll, I'll just share this as well. If you think about the ark and the temple, the temple had three levels, right? So did the ark. The temple had a window at the top, um, a window of light. So did the ark. There are lots of parallels uh, in the construction of the ark and the construction of the temple. So I believe it was also a figure of a temple of God. So, but let's get back to the garden. So you have, of course, the introduction of the tree of life. And again, you know, of course, we see the supernatural properties going back to the passage here. I'm going to skip now to Genesis 3.22. This is after the sin of Adam and Eve. God says, and the Lord God said, behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. So God says, Yahweh says unequivocally that if Adam or Eve eat from this tree, they, they're, they're going to live forever. So I, And I believe that's a literal statement that the fruit, this divinely planted and created fruit of the tree of life, I believe, had the ability to give them eternal life, to keep them up physically alive forever, right? And so, so yeah, it, it was supernatural. It was mystical, uh, definitely. And it did have a power. But, but the interesting thing, though, is that the tree is, I think, very important to God. And I think that it's God's, God conveys and uses it to gift eternal life and immortality to his children through this tree. Because if we see it, it's going to have a future presence. And I believe it, it still matters very much to God. And where do we see the evidence of that? Well, let's go right to the text. So look in Revelation. So this is Revelation chapter two. This is when Jesus is now giving the letters to the seven churches. And look, here's their letter to the church in Ephesus. It says, to the, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. God, God, Jesus is rebuking them saying, you, you've forgotten, you, you've lost your first love. And God says, remember from there, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So I think Jesus is letting us know that there is a tree of life that's already in heaven, right? And if you think about it, so much of what takes place on earth when it comes to God's design is a shadow, right, of the heavenly realm. And, I, and, and if you think about it, even from a dimensional standpoint, right, your shadow, your physical shadow, that when you're in the sun that's on the street or on a wall, your shadow is the two-dimensional version of you. Right, it, it is you, but just in two dimensions. Similarly, I think that what we see on Earth, so much of it is a type. We are a shadow of the heavenly realm, which has multiple four dimensions, the spirit dimension as well. And Moses, even when he was told to design the tabernacle, and he said he designed it after God showing him a vision of heaven, after the things that were shown to him on the mount. So. It's, it's, again, reflecting what takes place, what God has in heaven, in the heavenly temple. Similarly, just like there was a tree of life in the Garden of Eden, we see there's also a tree of life in heaven, in paradise, that Jesus is, again, offering as a gift to those who overcome by what? By faith in him, right? But let's see another reference to it here. So here's Revelation 22. Now, this is the new heaven and the new earth, right? This is after all sin is gone. The devil is now gone. Armageddon is long over after the millennium. This is now, we are now in perfect harmony with God. And there's no more sin, no more death. But what do we have? And he showed me, the angel showing John, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. 
in the midst of the street of it and on the side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits. I notice this is the trees on either side of the river. So it sounds like there's multiple trees. And I think the Greek allows for it being a tree, the tree of life, meaning trees of life and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And so again, so we see even in the eternal kingdom, in the new Jerusalem that comes again from heaven, notice it's planted like the Garden of Eden, right? God's going to plant a city on earth that literally descends from heaven. So what do we see? And this is what I call quantum repetition. This is God showing us from the earliest events. Like he says in Isaiah 46, I have declared the end from the beginning, just like we saw the garden come down with the tree of life in the beginning and a river, a river that broke into four rivers. We see again, a new garden, the new Jerusalem descend from heaven, get planted on earth. And what's there, a river of life and the tree of life that we can, again can eat from, right? And so God is sustaining uh, life forever through these waters and through the tree of life. And why would there be healing of the nations? Because, you know, remember, we are going to remember everything that's happened in our lives, everything that's happened in this world. And so we're going to, there are going to be tears, right? How do I know this? Because God said he's going to wipe away our tears. When we finally come into full realization and we can see God face to face, when we're in our glorified bodies, we're going to remember all the things we've done in our life. And we're going to be so happy and grateful that we made it, that there are going to be tears to wipe. So we're going to heal and God's going to heal the nations. We're all going to be healed and then live in eternal bliss with God. So awesome. So, I, so we see the tree of life has a prominent role and um, in God's design. And, I, and when you think about it too, right, how does immortality work? Well, I think it's like by, by receiving the food and the water that God is giving us, right? And Jesus uses this all the time, right? He says, I would give you waters of life to the moment the well. That's eternal life, right? But I think there's a metaphor there, but also a fact that, you know, angels, right, eat. Angels have sustenance. Angels, right, we were told that man did eat angels' food in the wilderness, right? The manna from heaven. So it's not like angels are just automatically immortal and just impervious to anything. They eat food, Right, that Abraham prepared food for angels on earth when, when two angels visited him at his home with Jesus. So, if God is saying that He's making a fruit that can live forever, I think that we're supposed to be eating it, and that's what's sustaining our immortality, that's what's sustaining us eternally. If we can drink the waters of this river and live, I think that's that's actually the order God is setting up, right? We're not just we're not we're not God, right? And so we we are sustained, even I believe, as immortal beings. And I think we see another example of this that's not often talked about where we see, I believe, the tree of life even in the millennium. So we're going to look at the book of Ezekiel, and I think we see a reference to the tree of life even in the millennial kingdom when there's still sin in the world, right? The millennium kingdom isn't perfect, right? The angels are gone. Satan and the angels are locked away, but there's still, you know, uh, mortal human beings who have to choose and do right, do wrong. There, there's punishments for those nations who don't come and worship Jesus in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles. But we also, believe, I believe, see the presence of the tree of life. So let's take a look here. And uh, sorry, let me give me one moment here. Let's see. What did I let me move that down here? Let me just bring up. I want to go to just to give the background here. I want to go to Ezekiel chapter 41 and that's where i think we get this wonderful description of the tree of life so i'm, I'm just actually going to going to read it to you because i cannot get up my graphic on it so let me just go to ezekiel 41 and i will just read it to you because it's a really interesting passage here so we read here let me cancel out of this Okay, so starting in verse one, I'm going to skip ahead, but I'm going to give the context. It says afterwards, of course, Ezekiel is being taken on a tour through the millennial temple, the temple that Jesus will rule and literally rule and sit out of and dwell in during the thousand years after Armageddon. And it says afterwards, he, the angel, brought me to the temple and measured the post six cubits broad on the one side and six cubits broad on the other side, which was the breadth of the tabernacle. And so I'm just going to skip down. And let's see here. And I am going to go to verse. Let 
let's go to, let me just skip ahead. I apologize for the delay, but let me just make sure I get this right. Okay, now actually, you know what? We're going to go to verse 40, to chapter 47 in Ezekiel. And so here, as it's continuing in this story in verse four, in chapter 47, in verse seven, here's what we read. Now, when I returned, behold, at the bank of the river were many trees on the one side and on the other. Then he, the angel said unto me, these waters issued out toward the east country and go into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, which, with, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. So again, we notice, notice how similar this is to New Jerusalem, where you have this river of life. And the angels telling Ezekiel in this uh, millennial temple, there's going to be a river. They're going to be a river that the waters will just give life to everything. Everything that touches these waters is going to live and be in abundance, abundant life. And there's also a tree on either side of the river. The same type of description we see of the tree of life in the book of Revelation. Now we can go to the next uh, graphic here. And we see here, as you go, continuing in Ezekiel 47, and this is verses 12 to 13. It says, but the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. Isn't it interesting? We talked about Sodom and Gomorrah before. What happened to Lot's wife if she was turned to salt? What happened to the area of Sodom and Gomorrah, the sea, the Dead Sea? It's filled with salt. It represents God's judgment. And again, remember, in the millennium, there's going to be judgment of God. It's not a perfect world. And it says, but continuing, it says, and by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed, meaning it won't be finished. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. So what do we see in the millennium? There's going to be trees of life on either side of this divine river that are going to give what medicine they're going to heal right so the nations are going to be healed and you come to jerusalem and you eat from these trees there will be healing and so again beautiful but we see the tree of life is a significant significant part of god's plan excuse me one second let me just get refreshed here <clears throat> and so so yeah so i think it's i think one is it is real it is supernatural, and it's really an important part of God's design and sustaining life. And when you think about going back to the garden and Adam and Eve and God punishing Adam and Eve by banishing them from the garden and putting a cherubim and a flaming sword to guard the path to Eden, because God said, lest he eat from the tree and live forever. Why did God do this? Was this just a punishment because God was upset and angry with Adam and Eve? He says, I'm not going to let you live anymore because now you've sinned once. No. It's actually a beautiful picture of God's salvation because here was the problem, right? When Adam and Eve sinned and brought sin physically into their bodies, into their genetics, right? We're told in Adam all died that by one man, we've all sinned because the sin nature is literally passed down in human genetics, right? We have not corrupted ourselves because of the sin of our first parents. Well, in that corrupted state, if Adam and Eve lived forever and ate from the tree of life, they couldn't be redeemed. Their bodies couldn't be redeemed. They couldn't receive their new bodies, right? Remember, our salvation isn't just spiritual. It's physical, right? Flesh and blood should not enter the kingdom of God. You have to receive a new spirit and a new body, the immortal body, the celestial body that Paul calls it in 1 Corinthians 15. And so if Adam and Eve were in this immortal state with corrupted sinful flesh, they couldn't be redeemed, right? Something like I think like what happened to the fallen angels, right? They ha already have celestial bodies that are corrupted, so they there's no redemption for them. And I think we see a picture of this in Revelation with the mark of the beast. If you think about the mark of the beast, I think it's very similar that by taking the mark, I believe it's not just an economic control. I believe it's also genetic, that it's changing you 
from being an image bearer of God, because I believe you're taking on the DNA of the Antichrist, the blood of the beast, the genetics of the Nephilim, of the fallen angels. So it permanently corrupts your body, disqualifying you from salvation. I think a similar thing would have happened to Adam and Eve. So God had to banish them and make sure they never ate from it. Why? Because he wanted to redeem them. Because he gave them the promise in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And Eve had to be that woman to give birth to the lineage that would lead to the Messiah. So if they corrupted themselves, the plan would have fallen apart. So God, again, you know, isn't it amazing how so many times when God seems like he's being irrational, God seems like he's being harsh, he's actually saving us from ourselves, from our own doom. And so this is another beautiful picture of that. So that is my answer to question number two on the tree of life. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope there's some good discussion. Have you seen me in the chat yet? Have you looked around for me? Um, like I said, I might be there watching, so stay tuned. And I have a special surprise. I'm going to do some rapid fire questions. I'm going to do at least three rapid fire questions so we can have at least a five question show today. And uh, we'll continue after this break. Okay, and you just saw the ad for the study guides for Judgment of the Nephilim and the final Nephilim, the sequel to Judgment of the Nephilim, and both books of mine. So the final Nephilim, by the way, goes into the end times. We want to talk about the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, the return of the fallen angels, the return of the Nephilim. It's all in the final Nephilim. It really goes right through the events of Revelation, right to Armageddon, to the return of the seed of the woman, our Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. And But the study guides are here. Excuse me. I, I want to give a little preview of what you can see in there. This is for the in-depth study. I have lots of details in my book. You can see there are lots of different types of questions, um, whether I go into the, I, I quote, hundreds of sources. I get into the etymology, the Greek and Hebrew. There are sections for prayer, for personal devotions. It's really a companion guide. If you want to get deep into the text and learn the scriptures, you can find it there. But if you don't, if you want to just get the book in a night and say, I don't want to get too deep with it, we also have the documentaries. There's Judgment of the Nephilim, Secrets of the Pre-Flood World, as well as the final Nephilim, Battle for Heaven and Earth. And these are both uh, films that I shot with a Hollywood film crew that are high-level overviews of both books. They're available in DVD, but also in digital format, right on Vimeo On Demand. And the links to all these things are in the description of this video. So hope you're liking, hope you're subscribing. If you're new, welcome. And by the way, if you have a question you want answered in a future episode, put it in the comments, especially if you're watching on replay. Thank you for watching. I get all my questions from the comments, whether it's on any of my social media platforms. I put them there. So uh, and let me throw up my social media as well while I'm at it. And you can find my social media there. So uh, like, subscribe, reach out to me, send me your questions. I'm happy to answer them. And some of that I just answer in the, in the comments as well. But you can also get your question on this show. So. Let's keep it moving and let's get back to our questions. And we're going to do some rapid fire right now. So I'm excited for this because I love, I get so many questions. I want to try and pack a number of them in today. So let's see what we have first. This is from Derek Otto. Uh, when were all the angels created? Genesis 1.1. And was the, cosmos, was the cosmos created there and the final touches put on the earth in the six days? Great, great question. And so this goes right to the heart of what I am currently researching for my newest book, because I am researching and writing as we speak. And so my answer is, when were the angels created? I would say in between uh, Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, we had the creation of the angels. And why do I know that? Because we're told, of course, in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And so I think in that passage, in that verse, we see the creation of the earth. And I think it's also the heavens, really, is what the, the, the grammar should be. Um, and the earth, and that gives us a little insight into uh, the ancient history that predates Adam and Eve. And how can we know there's a history? I think we get 
certain scriptural uh, clues and confirmations of this, namely in the book of Job, as we're going to look at first, is in Job chapter 38. Very famous passage. Job is now pleaded to God as to why his suffering is happening, and God finally responds and is basically showing how vast and how beyond Job's comprehension God truly is, Yahweh is. And he says to him, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And he goes through the creation process of creating the physically creating the earth, how God divinely created it and says, when the sons of God were shouting for joy, the morning stars sang. And so this is, again, a reference to who are the sons of God, the Benai Ha Elohim. We've spoken about them all throughout this night, right? The fallen, the angels, right? Because some are good, some are bad, but they're the angels. They were already in existence when the earth was created, which means they clearly predate Adam and Eve. And so I believe before the earth, so it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It was clearly in there that the angels were also created because they witnessed the creation of the earth. And so uh, let's go back because there were a couple of questions there. Just to make sure I got it. Was the cosmos created there? Yeah. So and where the final touches put on the earth in the six days. So what I think happens is that when God created the earth, he created it in one proclamation, perfect, beautiful, pristine. And what we see in Genesis 1-2 is the result of a judgment. That was is that there was darkness over the face of the deep, right? The deep is the Tehom, right? That's hell. So why is hell already there if the earth was just created? You know, who would be there, right? If no beings were created yet, why is there already a prison? Why is there darkness? Why is there a flood on the earth, right? I think because God is telling us, the scripture is telling us that there was a judgment that took place. And even when you look at the comparisons and the parallels, between Genesis 1 and Genesis 8, there are numerous ones. You have the earth covered in water, a sign of a judgment. You have darkness, which throughout, throughout the Old Testament, we're told darkness is a sign of God's cataclysmic divine judgment on earth. This is the day of the Lord. is a day of darkness, of gloominess, of dark clouds, right? That's, that's just one of the many passages. Then you have what brings everything back to creation. This is the spirit of God hovered over the waters. And that's when God says, let there be light. In Genesis 8, what does Noah do to know it's time to start the earth again, to start the whole process of the regenerated earth? He lets out a dove that flies over the waters, right? It brings back a branch, right? The dove, we know, is a form that the Holy Spirit took in the New Testament at the baptism of Jesus Christ. Lots of similarities. There's also animals involved supernaturally, right? God then brings the supernatural, brings animals to Adam supernaturally. He brought them to Noah supernaturally. Does it both have sins involving fruit, the forbidden fruit that we talked about already, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the forbidden fruit that Noah, the, dr the drunkenness that Noah uh, consumed. He drank the fruit of the vine, got drunk, and then Ham sinned against him. See how this all kind of ties together with the whole show, how it flows together. This is what the Holy Spirit does. But I think what God is showing us is that there is there was a judgment on the earth between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And the pristine earth that God created, and we're told in Isaiah 45, 18, specifically that God did not create the earth in vain when he made it. And that, that term in vain, tohu babohu, is exactly what we see in Genesis 1, 2. It says the earth was formless, without form and void tohu vabohu so those we have a contradiction there right and when there's a contradiction god is not wrong we're wrong we have to figure out what happened there's more to the story and so i think what the research will show what the history will show and what the grammar in hebrew shows that the earth became tohu vabohu so what we see in the six days is a renovation a re a repairing a regeneration of the earth actually that was judged and so that's all i'm reading that's that all we're going to be in my new book i'm going to explore the ancient age the original satanic rebellion all these things are going to be in what i'm working on right now so much more to come on that great question so let's go to rapid fire question number two okay this is from natalie korea and she said do you think that the heavenly hosts or stars are actual angels so this is an easy question. The answer is absolutely yes. So you see repeatedly references to the heavenly host in scripture. And I believe that that is definitely a reference to angelic beings. I think the easiest evidence of this is in Deuteronomy chapter four. And in verse 19, God is talking about, he's commanding the Israelites to not worship the star, the sun, the moon, the stars, then heaven, and the host of them, right? I believe that's a reference to 
the fallen angelic beings that he's God is saying, do not worship them. We see another reference in Revelation chapter 12 when it says the dragon pulled down a third of the stars from heaven. I believe that's a reference not just literal stars. Uh, I think it's talking about the angels who rebelled with him, right? So as, it, as they're being dragged down to earth and cast out in the great tribulation. And so I definitely think that we see reference to the heavenly host and even the term host, right? In ancient language, a host is an army, right? That's what God is talking about here when he talks about the heavenly host. He's talking about his armies that he fights with, right? Uh, we're told in the Old Testament, our God is man of war, right? There's a war taking place in the heavenlies and the heavenly hosts are a descriptive term of an army, of a group of beings who have organization, who have structure, who have chain of command. So these aren't just, I believe, stars in the sky. This is a, definitely a reference to heavenly beings. So awesome question. All right, let's do one more rapid fire question we have. This is from Shane Rich, 1022. If the Antichrist is a Nephilim, will part of the deception be that his blood appears to heal a new virus or something that existed previously? Maybe transhumanism related. Love this question. Excellent question. So, uh, so the answer, short answer is yes, I believe definitely. You know, think of the Antichrist. He is the ultimate mimic of Jesus Christ. He is a satanic imitation of the true Messiah. So he is trying to convince the world that he's their God, that he's their savior. And if you look at what the turning point for the Antichrist is in winning the world over, it's in Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, when he receives his mortal wound and is healed. That's when it says the whole world says, who is like the beast? Who can make war unto him? He seems unstoppable. He's invincible. He's God, right? And so what if, and I believe this is what's going to take place, what if the Antichrist offers his blood, his divine power, which is actually satanic power, but it's from the divine realm, to humanity? And how can you do this? Again, through the mark of the beast. What if he says, if you mingle with my seed, with my DNA, with my blood, right? Jesus, it's the blood of Christ that saves us, right? By his stripes, we are healed. Jesus is literally using his blood supernaturally, supernatural realm to serve as an atoning sacrifice to redeem us from sin, from hell, from death. The Antichrist, I believe, is going to mimic that and say, take my blood and you receive my immortality. Just the way I overcame a deadly wound, you won't die. And so I think, yeah, I think his blood will be a big part of that. And if you think about all the plagues that are going to be on the earth in the great tribulation, people are going to be dying for a supernatural solution. And if all you have to do is take a mark in your hand and be cured of the plagues, or at least be told you'll be cured of them that are plaguing the earth, I think people will run and flock and do everything in their power to get to it, right? You already just look today. You mentioned transhumanism, Shane, and look today at all the millions, if not billions at this point of dollars that are being pumped into what's called life extension technology. The biggest uh, tech companies in the world are looking into technology to ex not just extend human life, but to actually literally overcome death. And I talk about this uh, in the final Nephilim. I have a whole section on the transhumanist movement and how even some of these organizations, there's even one organization that's called the Methuselah Foundation. So they're getting, this is stuff about ripped from the headlines. They're, they're taking that right out of the days of Noah, that they're trying to prolong life like Methuselah who had the longest lifespan, 969 years in scripture. And they reference the Bible on their own website. And so the seeds of this are already being planted today. There are people now who already, who are planning on living to be 180 years old, 200 at present, right? But through technology, but you add in a fallen angelic supernatural element to that, and this will just take off. And I think we actually, I think they will achieve it for a temporary time, right? You look at Revelation 9 again, you go back to the release of the fallen angels. We talked about the opening of the abyss of the bottomless pit. When these beings come out, when Apollyon returns to earth, that angel, right? What happens? It says that for five months, while while the unsaved world are being tormented, it said, "Men shall seek death, but shall not find it." There is going to be a temporary immortality on earth for those who have taken the mark, for those who are following the Antichrist, for those who have been deceived. And look, where is it going to come from? From mingling seed, as it was in the days of Noah. This is why, again, Genesis six is so important because Jesus said, "If you want to know what's going to happen before I return, 
Look to Genesis 6. He said, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So I think everything we're seeing today with transhumanism is setting the world up for the strong delusion, for the greatest deception that will ever devastate humanity, believing the lie, believing the Antichrist is the Messiah, and not only pledging allegiance to him, taking on his very genetics to corrupt yourself and disqualify yourself forever, right? Just like the devil tried to do to Adam and Eve, he wanted them to eat from that tree of life. He wanted them to be forever corrupted and damned like him, but God rescued them and God can rescue you and God can rescue your loved ones. How? By believing and trusting in Jesus Christ. So share this word, share this message. Cause like I said, no book has this. You're not gonna find any book that talks about all these things, transhumanism, beings, UFOs, uh, genetics, the, the, all these things, you know, economics being controlled by technology in your hand, all these things that's only in the Bible. What a book, what a word, what a God that we have. So share that word and uh, let's save some souls, shall we, beloved? So that is my answer to my rapid fire. Great show tonight. I hope you enjoyed it, this rebroadcast. I hope uh, we had some great, lively discussion tonight. Um, again, for more information, all my social media is in the description to this video. You will also find links to the books, to the study guides, to the documentaries. It's all there, also available on Amazon and even on Barnes and Noble as well. So reach out to me. Again, if you're watching on replay, put your questions in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this show and I hope to be back live next week, but thank you for watching. God bless you and see you next Thursday. Ooh.